a real treat today on Veg Your Best. We'll be going out into the world of animal rescue, and we have put together another interview on the podcast, this time with Anna Barini, who works at Vine Sanctuary, an animal rescue organization located in Springfield, Vermont, not all that far from where I sit today in Western Massachusetts. Anna Barini is not only one of the outreach and educational coordinators at Vine Sanctuary, she's hands-on doing it all with the small staff they have at Vine. They do animal rescue as well as ongoing animal care and feeding for over 700 non-human animals on a little over 100 acres. You will hear some of the challenges there. And among those challenges, not a lot of free time with that many animals. So Anna was speaking to us from the pasture in the middle of the sanctuary. And you will hear that she's not chatting from a studio, but on the ground, as it were. So apologies for any quality issues in Anna's sound. And listen in the interview for what Vine Sanctuary means, the acronym V-I-N-E. And listen too for how Anna got involved, what veganism means to her, and how all of us, all of us, can really help support the mission of Vine in one way or another. So, veg heads and veg your besties, please enjoy this springtime in Vermont interview. There will be roosters roostering. Enjoy. Anna Barini, welcome to Veg Your Best podcast. Thank you so much for making the time. I, I understand you are actually out in the sanctuary right now. I am. It's also, it's Anna. Sorry. Anna. Anna Barini. Thank you very much. Yes. I'm sorry. No, it's all good. It's a, it's a tricky, it's, a, it's easy to uh, get fooled, the Italian <laughs> pronunciation. But yeah, I, I am uh, sitting in my car looking at uh, Sir Isaac Mouton, one of the cows. And there's some chickens milling about because they think I might have a snack or two. Oh, wow. So how many, how many, I'm going to tell my, my audience, you work at Vine Sanctuary in Springfield, Vermont. And I'm going to let you introduce what the mission is there of Vine Sanctuary and what you do there. But first of all, how many animals are there? Um, we have a, roughly 700. Um, oh, wow. We kind of, the number fluctuates almost weekly because we get so many requests for chickens and roosters specifically. Um, roosters are the animals that we get the most calls about, especially this time of year because people do chicken hatching projects. And when they get 12 chickens from uh, tractor supply and they tell them there's no roosters and then they end up with 12, 12 roosters, um, a lot of times they get dumped or people try to get rid of them. Um, so we get a lot of chickens and roosters kind of weekly almost. Mammals, we have to be a little bit more considerate of who we take. It's a little, it's it's a lot more of a big deal to take a single cow or multiple cows than it is to take in a couple chickens. And so 700 includes many of the, of the uh, birds. Yes. So we have, um, I would say half the population a little bit more than half is birds, but we have chickens, goats, sheep, um, cows, uh, emus, one peacock, a pig, um, guinea fowl, ducks, geese, who am I forgetting? Pigeons, dogs, <laughs> you know, like we just, it's kind of it, alpacas. <laughs> I'm just looking around to see who I may have missed. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful that you're right there in the center of it all. So tell me, Anna, how did you come to Vine Sanctuary or how, how did Vine Sanctuary come into being? You choose the direction of the, the order that you, you tackle that in. Well, Vine um, was originally founded 20 years ago on the eastern shore of Maryland by co-founders Miriam and Patrice Jones. They just happened to find a chicken on the side of the road. Um, and they didn't realize it at the time, but they were living on the Delmarra Peninsula and they were in the area where the industrial farming of chickens was invented and perfected. Um, so 
they were just completely surrounded by these large scale chicken farms, um, like Smithfield and Purdue. Um, and so it just happened by chance. They found who they thought was a hen, but ended up being a rooster named Victor Frankel and they credit him as the third co-founder of Vine. And we've grown ever since. And about 10 years ago, they moved to Vermont um, because at the time they weren't, I mean, they had a private home basically that became a chicken sanctuary and it, it, they had a nice yard and everything, but it wasn't like they had property like we do now where we have about 105 acres with cows and they couldn't do mammals or or anything like that. So they moved to Vermont for lots of different reasons, but one of them was because there were no sanctuaries in Vermont and Vermont is a traditional dairy state. Um, so it was a place that had a lot of need for a sanctuary and there wasn't one and it just kind of worked out for everything. There's a Smithfield plant in Maine. We can still focus a lot on chickens, but also um, as an eco-feminist organization, um, the dairy industry is particular, particularly anti-feminist. Um, so being able to kind of participate in that. And, you know, they were dealing with a lot of climate change issues. Um, their well had gone dry, uh, I think one or two times before they moved. Um, and Vermont, we also deal with some, but it's less so than what's happening um, on the Eastern shore of Maryland. So that's, you, you've brought up about five different ways we can go here. I, I'm fascinated. And so, and an eco-feminist organization, I want to go back to, I love that their, I love their first, their first rescue was named Victor Frankel. What an, what a yes. resonant, what a resonant sort of name. And uh, we, we quote him on the podcast now and again of his um, man's search for meaning work, but oh, cool. um, yeah, yeah. But so, so how did you now come to Vine? Well, I came to Vine. I, I kind of liked how you said Vine um, came to be because Vine kind of came to me. Um, I had been working at a um, youth homeless shelter and I got really burned out. I had finished my graduate. I have a graduate degree in creative writing. Um, so I was like, I was just like kind of done and I took a step back from everything, focused a little bit more on my health, um, and I was working at a bookstore. Um, and if you know anything about small independent bookstores, you know that you don't make much money and you don't work very much. So I was kind of looking for a second job, and I mm -hmm. loved the bookstore, but I was looking for something else I could do. And I was like, maybe I can babysit, you know, whatever, because um, I liked it. I liked being able to go to work and then come home. Um, and I saw an ad in our local newspaper, the Vermont Journal, that was three lines long, that was like morning chores, help needed, please call. And so I called and it was Vine. And the rest is history. And I've been here for three, uh, like three and a half years now. And what do your duties primarily include there? So I started just doing like morning chores stuff. We call it opening. Um, so uh, a lot of what I do is I come in in the morning and I'm the person that is the first one on site um, on what we call the hill, which is where um, it's the mammals live. Um, so I make sure everybody gets fed, make sure everybody's healthy from the night before. I open up the coops. If anybody gets medication or needs medical treatment, um, I can do that. So I kind of just generally check everything out. And then I go to our back pasture and, and do cow count. So a couple of times a day we go back. So we have four cows currently in our front pasture, which is where the goats and sheep and everybody lives with birds. And then in our further back pasture, um, we have what we like to call the hardy herd, which is a group of cows that are, um, they're okay by themselves. So they kind of have their own group. They have their own society that they've built back there. And we just go check on them. Some of them are almost feral is the best way to describe it. They don't like humans. We don't touch them. Um, they trust us enough that we can be near them, but they don't want to be messed with. A lot of those folks have actually liberated themselves from beef and dairy farms, sometimes with calves. Um, so they just kind of do their own thing and make their own rules. And we just make sure that nobody's hurt if somebody's sick. We can keep an eye on them, make sure they get the meds they need. They get hay. Um, and then in the wintertime, some of those um, folks come down to the front pasture because they're older or they've had an injury. Um, we just brought two calves back for the first time. 
Um, so they were down this winter because they're just too little, but they're with their moms. So they're old enough. They're not quite old enough, but they're big enough and they're with their moms that they can be in the back pasture. So, and then I just, you know, fill water, double check everything. And I'm also um, the outreach and humane education coordinator. So um, I run our education uh, program. I do events. I help with donor relations. We kind of all do multiple things here. There's only seven of us that work at Vine. Um, so everybody has multi roles. <laughs> it sounds like a lot of uh, responsibility for only seven people. There's a lot of lives there. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, yeah. But, you know, we work as a team um, and we don't really have the ability um, financially to have more than that. So you know, we're a nonprofit and we are, the majority of our support comes just from individual donors that are about less than $20 a month. Um, so, I mean, we do get some grant support for specific programs that we do. Um, and that's great. And, you know, like family foundations, people will make, you know, end of the year contributions, but the majority of it is less than 20 bucks a month. So it's not like we can have a staff of 25 people. You know what I mean? Right. Well, you know, sometimes necessity is the mother of invention. And if you have an important why, if you have an important reason, you figure it out, right? I mean, I think this is this is what we all learn that uh, when we're kind of like apathetic or yeah, whatever about an issue, it doesn't get solved. But when we're like so all true. in, when we're all in, we figure it out. And so it sounds like you guys have kind of figured it out, but I have to ask about cows liberating themselves sometimes with <laughs> caps, please. Yes. Let me know how so, that how that looks. We have a couple of cows that have jumped fences. So cows can jump fences. Cows are ridiculously smart. They can figure out how to undo locks. They can jump fences. So that's just like a good baseline. Um, we have a couple of cows who jumped fences or got out of a paddock or got through a gate. And one was found on I-95 um, by an animal control officer. Her name is um, Sirsha, which means like freedom in Gaelic. Um, and she was just like running along the highway, basically. Um, she was done. She had gotten herself out. And so um, the animal control officer, they were able to get her. And they brought her to us because she needed a home. In the case of Ebony, we have two moms with, here with their children who actually um, liberated themselves with calves. Ebony and her son, Ivory. Aw, <laughs> love it. Yeah, we don't know if she came from um, uh, a beef or dairy farm, um, but she somehow got out with Ivory when he was probably a month or two old, um, just from the size of him when we got him. And she ran through the woods of upstate New York for probably another month or two. Um, and she was with a companion cow who also, we don't know if she, the cow got out with them or they met them on the way. It's not unusual for cows to get out in areas with large, um, beef and dairy farms. It's just a thing that happens. Um, but that companion was actually shot, uh, cause it's legal to shoot cows, um, if they're out and keep them because people will then keep them for beef. I see. Um, but they ended up in somebody's backyard, um, calmed down enough that this person called Farm Sanctuary and was like, hey, we have this cow with a baby. I can keep them until this was like late summer, early fall. I can't keep them for the winter. What do I do slash can you help me? Um, and Farm Sanctuary was able to get them there, but they wouldn't have done well there. And they knew that. Uh, farm Sanctuary is, was the first farm to animal sanctuary in the United States. Um, they have two locations, one in Watkins Glen and one in Southern California. We work a lot with the Watkins Glen um, uh, sanctuary because of where they're located. Um, but they have a network of other, where they work with other sanctuaries where they can handle some of the like upfront medical issues if anybody has it, transport to other places, but then they can help get those animals that need um, a different setup than they have to get to other sanctuaries. And that's why Ebony and Ivory got here. You know, not every sanctuary works for every animal. Um, Jan and Justin, Jan had a similar situation where she jumped a fence. She was pregnant with Justin. 
and they were originally at Farm Sanctuary, but she is way too stressed out by people. And there's a lot more people coming in and out of there. They do tours. They have internship programs that are awesome, but it just didn't work for her. Um, and she's a lot like she's a lot like Ebony. She needs her space. And interesting enough, Ebony was pregnant when she got to Vine, and Cora was born last year in the back pasture on June 19th. So she'll be a year old in just about a month. Wow. Yeah. Well, so we, you know, so a farm sanctuary is Gene Bauer's uh, organization, yeah. right? Okay. Yep. And yeah, I've, I've heard him speak many times and he is like yourself, a very, in, in spite of the fact that you um, are working in an organization that sees a lot of kind of, well, not kind of, a lot of painful things, um, extremely upbeat and extremely warm and extremely, you know, forward thinking, not as down as you might um, imagine some people could be seeing this sort of treatment of animals. How, how, do, how is it you keep your upbeat uh, personality in these situations? Uh, it is not always easy. Um, PTSD is quite common among folks that work in animal rescue. Um, but I will say it's a lot easier when the pasture is green and the sun is shining like it is today. You don't uh. want to talk to me in early February because everything <laughs> is, we all have a day in February where I like to say, uh, one of the team members I work with, Rachel, it's like January 27th. She's usually like, I'm done. I'm quitting. I can't do this. <laughs> and well, I'm like, oh, right on schedule. And then we laugh about it. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's really tough. Um, yeah. But if you, if you don't find the good in it, you're not going to last. Um, yeah. And I think that for me, I tried to be better about, you know, taking my days off seriously. And sometimes it's physically and emotionally demanding. And sometimes, you know, you just, you stay in bed until you, you sleep in, you read a book, and then you don't really do much the rest of the day. And that's okay. Um, and mm -hmm. I've also never really had hobbies because I'm a workaholic and I've tried to, um, to like get more hobbies. So like I take dance classes and, um, you know, it's just helpful to have something to do outside of the work here because it is all consuming. And if you don't have that, you will burn out and you won't last very long. It's really common. Um, but you know, like you see horrible stuff and it's not like, I don't think about it all the time, but you have to kind of come up with coping skills for that. Because you, your work is necessary. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, yes. So, and that's, I think this is very good advice, even for people who are certainly not on the kinds of front lines that you are with animal rights or ethical um, concerns, but people who are just making a different choice in terms of how they live their lives. To, uh, a, a lot of people can really start becoming overly, um, well, but just perseverating on the horrors of life instead of what they can actually do, because they can then start discounting that what they do is not enough and second guessing sure. and what's the point, right? So, right. So your, your advice of self-care, of diversifying your activities, of giving your brain a break sounds like it would be useful for most people. Oh yeah. I think that anyone that becomes a vegan, it's really easy to fall down like the animal torture porn trap where all you do is watch like documentaries that just depress you because, you know, the world is ending and it's so easy just because it's like, once you're aware of it, you can't not be aware of it, yeah. but you don't have to watch every documentary. You don't have to read every article or look at, um, you know, I don't need personally to look at uh, you know, footage from factory farms because I've seen it. So right. I don't always like watch those videos because I've, you know, like I've been there. I don't need to see slaughterhouse footage. I've been there. Like, and mm -hmm. I think that sometimes you don't need to watch it and that's okay. It doesn't make you less of an activist or a vegan. Um, because if you watch every single one, you're just going to drive yourself crazy. So, you mm. know, watch the cute cow video you know, look at Instagrams of sanctuaries. It's just yeah. better, you know, find, find the beauty in it and don't always focus on the negative. Cause if you do, it will drive you crazy. 
Yeah, because there are just billions and billions of animals yeah. out there that are being tortured or killed and on a daily yep. type of basis. And so we really do need to stay in our power, in our lane. Absolutely. Um, yes, hmm. I agree. Yeah, I think I think, um, you know, I am certainly not someone in your category of activism. And so I um, I want some of my listeners to hear that someone in your category also uh, it's time, the time we spend getting ourselves upset is time we also don't spend on anything produ- productive. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's beautiful that you demonstrate that in your life because, um, okay. and, well, you have to tell me also about the um, eco-feminist organization that is Vine Sanctuary. Tell me what that means, because I think that that and the dairy industry is obviously yeah. an, uh, an, an issue. So this is definitely more of our co-founder Patrice's uh, wheelhouse, but I will do my best. If you want to learn about ecofeminism, number one, um, Carol J. Adams is an incredible scholar. She wrote The Sexual Politics of Meat, which I think is required reading for all vegans, but especially female or women identifying vegans. Um, So Vine is a proudly LGBTQ feminist organization. We were founded by queer folks. We are staffed by a lot of queer folks. Um, And we also, like Miriam and Patrice met at a disability rights march um, rally. Patrice was a member of ACT UP. Like we come from a, we come from different um, uh, activism backgrounds, um, which then kind of, which then means that we don't, we're not just here for the animals. We're here for the liberation of all because we're all animals. And if one group is being oppressed, we're all being oppressed because we live within a larger system. So ecofeminism is where the intersection of the environmental rights um, movement meets the feminist movement. And um, dairy is a perfect example of that because the reason why cows make milk is because they have babies. They don't just make milk nonstop. And that's a... a uh, something that we have kind of lost as a culture is understanding that cows are mammals you make milk when you have a baby and what happens is they're with their children sometimes for a couple days mostly for an hour or two and then their babies are ripped away from them and they are hooked up to machinery to then um, assault them into producing milk Um, dairy cows are artificially inseminated People literally stick their hands inside of them to put Mm -hmm. in semen so that then they can have babies that will be taken away from them so that their milk can be taken from them. Like the whole situation, if we were doing this to people, we were doing this to human beings, we would be outraged, but we're doing it. And, you know, we, it's really easy as activists and, you know, liberals, I guess, um, to say, oh, there can't be kids in cages when then you're going to go get ice cream after your rally that you went to and you're so upset, but you're Mm -hmm. literally separating mothers from their children. And there are, we have evidence. Cows have deep affection for their children, deep love from the jump. It's very similar to how you get that. I mean, I'm not a mother, so I don't know, Mm -hmm. but the idea that when women give birth, it's like this instance, or even from, you know, you, you know, you love your child from the jump. It's the same idea with cows. And then they're immediately taken from their moms. They're only, they're only there long enough that they're, um, that they are, they're only there long enough to make the milk be produced. Um, and then male calves are almost all immediately killed within the first five months or so. Mm-hmm. The price of veal has gone down. So sometimes they are just um, murdering them sooner in time because um, they, they aren't worth anything and they can take a loss on their profit and loss sheets uh, as mm-hmm. a farmers. And then the female cows are just put back into the same system. Well, so this is in a nutshell. I don't know if that answered your question. No, it did. It, it did, Anna. It did. Because uh, in a nutshell, I'm, I'm not that articulate articulate about explaining the dairy industry and why it's a problem for vegans. And as a, as a woman who came to veganism and much later in life after I'd had children far after I was in my 50s when I really the scales kind of fell from my eyes in this area because we are 
really taught not to see any of this. And it's not, it's, and even, even when we sort of know it, we can't know it because we protect ourselves. And, Mm -hmm. um, and, and I, and I, I, um, I encourage people to just, even just, even if you're not prepared to fully embrace this issue, to just open a little bit, just to lean into what this means for, for how we live our lives and what we take seriously. Um, because sometimes it takes a few repetitions. Sometimes it takes thousands of repetitions before we can really see this industry for what it is. It's not what they uh, hope, you know, what, when my, my, I have a grandson now and, you know, all mm-hmm. the books have a happy, have a happy yep. farm, right? You happy know? cows do not come from California. Like that is a total <laughs> lie. It is uh, not the bucolic thing that you think it is in Vermont. You know, small family farms do the exact same thing. Um, and the sad part is the dairy industry is suffering, which is wonderful, but that's impacting, especially the small, like local cheese and right. milk producer. And really what we should be doing instead of trying to label, you know, oat milk is like oat juice or whatever they're trying to do come up with for it that's just the big ag big dairy industry lobbying for that Mm. and what we should be doing is helping these local farms transition to a more sustainable um more profitable um you know form of farming like mushrooms or whatever whatever can grow where you are because the dairy industry is dying but they're going to be the ones that suffer not people like the large you know Sure. Milk Archer producers. Daniels or whoever. Yes, exactly. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And also, uh, and, and it takes, and, and we're seeing that dairy, um, that section of the supermarket, we're seeing how, how uh, powerful the consumer is just the Absolutely. individual consumer. And maybe some of them aren't choosing for the same reasons that you are so aware of in the industry. Maybe some of them are choosing because they think it's going to be different for their weight or for their cholesterol or for their, their health, but whatever gets people's attention, I I'd like to think whatever works is good. <laughs> so. you know, I mentioned Carol Adams earlier, um, mm. but she has said to almost everyone that she encounters, it doesn't matter how you got here, you got here. Yeah. So, you know, that's really what the thing is. Like I didn't really, I did not put together for, I've been a vegan for about five years now. Mm-hmm. Um, I have been a vegetarian. I have been all sorts of different things. I only eat cheese with my family. You know, I, I grew up Italian in the Midwest. My dad used to be a, literally was a cowboy on beef farms. Mm. So I grew up in a family where, you know, meat and potatoes was the norm. And if you don't eat cheese, there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I've been kind of, I've thrown protests at the dinner table and then eaten a, you know, a steak three days later. It's just, it was one of those things, but I did not understand the cognitive dissonance in myself of cows do not create milk unless they have been pregnant until like five years ago, like Mm -hmm. literally did not put that together, even though it makes total sense. So, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of this is something that we have been so ingrained to not see. And it's really easy not to, but it's like, like you said, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And that's however right. you get there, that's what matters because you got there. And there's added bonuses. If you stop drinking milk, your cholesterol will go down. So if that's right. what you're here for, cool. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think because some some people feel that that it there there are different classifications of vegans that you know there the people who started in from the health point of view aren't serious vegans and um, that I think there's an argument to be made by by all well-meaning people but my audience and what I work with is that however you got here you got here and however you're even however you're getting there is great you know I a lot most people that I have been aware of have not been able to do an overnight transition because there yeah. are just so many as, as you well, even as you're saying that, you know, with your family, your culture, your, um, your relationships, it is, it is difficult. Um, we have a, a an entire, uh, economy and a culture that makes us take for granted certain things and look away from other things. And some of that's good. Some of it's good and some of it's really kind of scary. Yep. So this is one of the scary parts. Yeah. 
I'll say this, you know, individually as a person, me, myself, and I, I think it's great when anybody, however you get there, you get there. And we also believe that at Vine, but, you know, vegan is when you, when you really look at being a vegan, it's not about your diet. It's, it's a radical, almost political view of um, completely um, looking at systems of oppression and how you are rejecting them and living in a more um, compassionate lifestyle based on like mutual aid and getting rid of that. So that is something that I think that there can be a difference between someone just being plant-based, which mm-hmm. is great versus being a vegan. Um, because I agree. that, that is a, like, a, there is that difference there. Um, but like I said, you can start as plant-based and get to being a ve- like if you want to call yourself a vegan I'm not going to argue with you um but like there is a little bit more we like to say so vine stands for veganism is the next evolution and we tell vegans it means veganism is not enough because if yeah. you're not actively trying to work to end these systems of oppression that we live in that we put animals into you're not really doing enough um but you're getting there and that's what matters. I think that's really, I think that's such a positive thing. And I'm going to ask you to repeat what Vine stands for, the two different ones again, because I think that's so beautiful. Say it again. We, uh, so Vine is veganism is the next evolution. Mm -hmm. And then um, we tell people that are already vegan, but it's veganism is not enough. Mm. So it's not just your diet. It's every other way that you're, it's all of, it's all of it. Um, and I like to think personally for myself that veganism is a daily practice. So every day I wake up and I think, okay, it's not about what creamer I'm putting in my coffee. It's not about what I'm going to eat for dinner. What am I doing to actively live in the world in a more compassionate um, way and to try and be better and recognize when I'm not and how I'm upholding like white supremacy and um, speciesism and stuff like that. So that like, I really try to look at it every day. Like, okay, did I do a good job today? Cool. Did I not? What can I learn from that? Anna, I think that's wonderful advice for all of us. I I always call myself a practicing vegan, not because I'm hiding something (laughs) about it, but because I feel like it's, it is a practice is like, what else am I not seeing? Because I didn't Absolutely. see, I didn't see the animal issues for for many years, and so it's when as a practicing vegan, that's what now. What else do I not see about my own mm-hmm. life, about my community, about how I can show up differently? So for me, it's like my whole world ex- really expanded when I uh, started with this practice, mm-hmm. and I love I love that you you feel the same way, even though as an activist, there's always more to do. You d- are not resting on your well-deserved laurels there in the, in the sanctuary. That's wonderful. Can, now help, help me understand. I know you, you're very busy and I want to, I want to um, respect your time, but because the animals need you, <laughs> but um, how can, how can my listeners, I will put the show uh, in the show notes. I will put links to, um, to vine and to any other um, things that you think um, the, the listeners might um, learn something from. But how can they maybe support the kind of work you do, even if it's whether it's at Vine or some other organizations that you would like to point them towards? So I always tell people that the easiest way to support the animals, the non-human animals that live here at Vine is to go vegan and stay vegan. Um, Because if we live in a vegan world, we will not need sanctuaries. Um, Obviously, we always need money because these guys eat a lot. And uh, most of our money goes, almost all of our money actually goes towards animal care um, and feeding, basically. We have pretty high vet bills because we have aging animals. A lot of people think that cows die at five. Cows can live until they're in their mid twenties. Um, we have alpacas that are almost 20. You know, they, they can live quite long, um, long lives. And with that, it's like people eventually stuff starts to not work as much. You got to take arthritis meds, you know, you get sick a little bit easier, even, you know, your, your body is just wearing down. And the unfortunate thing about most of our animals is even if they have, you know, long lives, they come out of industries where their bodies have been genetically modified to the point where they have issues from the beginning of their lives because they're not supposed to live past a certain date or They come from situations of abuse and neglect. So they have underlying issues that just make everything harder. 
Um, but another thing I like to tell people, so we're in Southern Vermont. Um, and if you're interested in the sanctuary world and in helping, find a sanctuary and kind of adopt it. It could be mine. It could be one that's local to you. Um, learn about them and volunteer, help out, you know, um, spread the word. With Vine, we are a little bit under the radar from a lot of sanctuaries because um, we are an anti-capitalist organization and we also do not accept funds to come on to, we don't do tours for money um, because that is uh, against our ethics. We don't wanna be a vegan petting zoo, basically. Um, what we do instead is we have volunteer days. Now, obviously the last year we haven't been able to do really any volunteer days because of COVID. Um, but if you're local to the area, you know, within Western Mass even, um, we're in Southern Vermont, we're about an hour and a half from Northampton. Um, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram. We always post our volunteer days. We're hoping to do some smaller ones this summer. Vermont is kind of officially open as of July 4th. Um, so we're hoping to do some more uh, some more stuff then. Obviously, still with COVID precautions in place, we can't get sick as a staff. There's only eight of us, um, but mm. also just to keep the general population safe. But that's a really great way to help sanctuaries overall is to volunteer your time, especially if you have a special skill. If you're good at digital marketing, reach out to your local sanctuary, see if they need help writing a newsletter or coming up with logos. If you are a carpenter, we have a master carpenter that is one of our volunteers. He built our pig house and we just had to buy the wood and he did the rest of it. Um, we have another person that is just, our Dave is an all around awesome guy and he's always fixing stuff. And he gets mad because we will literally, if you can duct tape it and then put it with bailing twine and like tie it together, we will do it. And then Dave comes and he is just like, can't, can you just let me go to Ace Hardware? Just let me go to bed and fix it, like for real. So if you have any, or even gardening, like whatever it is that you like to do, that might be helpful to a sanctuary. Um, and so reach out and just say, hey, I got Wednesday afternoons off and I like doing so-and-so. It's just a great way to um, get involved. And, you know, sanctuaries always need money and they always need hands. So that's like one of the best ways. <laughs> that's great. So what you're basically saying is everybody can do something. Absolutely. They can they can participate by uh, opting out of the consumption of animal products or buying animal products. Um, they can opt. They can uh, help out by actually just donating money, and they can also reach out and offer a skill or um, or serve in some way, even shoveling poop i'm assuming <laughs> oh oh yeah we have a lot of poop and it always needs shoveled um yeah. but another thing that, that is really helpful for sanctuaries is if you like like and comment on their social media stuff that's great like that right there is huge is a, is a huge help it, you can follow people on insta you can follow us on instagram um or our facebook like that right there is big sign up for mailing lists um, you know, just little things can actually make a huge difference. That's great. Who among us cannot like or comment on social media? Absolutely. We're doing it already. That's a low bar. <laughs> <laughs> Anna, thank you so much for taking time away from your, your morning chores and, uh, and all your animal friends. I don't even know. Is that too anthropomorphic to call them friends? I know they no, have, they have, friends. they have human names. I see. So that's a little bit anthropomorphized. And do. I think that's, Yeah. Some of them don't, you know, we, um, you know, Sir Isaac Mouton, for example, has a more human name uh -huh. that's been, that's been changed, but other of them, I'm trying to think, Ice, that's not human, he's our, he's our peacock, he's all white, they named oh, him Ice, wow. and then there's Domino, who is, uh, he's an alpaca, so some of them have, have names that are a little more anthropomorphic than others, but I see. we like to let the animals name themselves. Uh, we get to know their personalities and then they almost always name themselves weirdly enough isn't that wonderful that you get the opportunity to really get to know their personalities um I, that kind I'm, of... I'm very very lucky um mm. that I that I get to do this work Anna thank you so much for making your time available to to my listeners you're welcome thanks for having me and I hope everyone will will uh at least at the very least if you will follow 
uh, Vine Sanctuary on Instagram and Facebook and like and comment. And then I'll put in the show notes other ways you can be a little bit more proactive. Thank you, Anna, and uh, have a great day. You as well. Thanks, Michelle. Have a good one. So what did you think of Anna Barini, huh? So interesting that Anna's activism on behalf of the animals does not discount the very real support all of us can be. Even, even just by liking or commenting on Vine Sanctuary's social media accounts or supporting a sanctuary that is nearer to you geographically or nearer your heart. V-I-N-E. Vegan is next evolution, and veganism is not enough. I hope you enjoyed listening to Anna and that you might be inspired to even 1% up-level how you show up in the world. Maybe there are different issues that are primary for you, and issues sometimes seem intractable and overwhelming. But whatever issue it is that really challenges your heart, how you can help. We can do things. We can do something. And don't ever let the thought that it's not enough keep you from something. Just look at that non-dairy dairy aisle. And if you want to know more about Vine Sanctuary, you can find it on Facebook, on Instagram, and Twitter. And their website is vinesanctuary.org. I will, of course, put the links in the show notes. And if you're interested in supporting Vine with a financial donation, Vine is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation, and they mention on their website that a monthly gift of as little as $5 can help to feed more than 500 animals at Vine. In fact, I think it's up to over 700 animals that they will feed with those dollars. So Thank you for listening, and I hope that you're inspired to do one small thing today to support an issue, whether it's animal rights, animal ethics, veganism, or something that is more pressing for you right now. Go out and make a difference. Veg Your Best. Veg Your Best podcast production, music, and editing by Charlie Weinshank. Thanks, Charlie. Before you go, it would mean so much to me and the Veg Your Best team if you would hit subscribe, leave us a five-star review, or share with someone you think might be interested. Something about algorithms, it helps bump us up a little in the rankings, and that's the best way to help others find the podcast and for us to find our audience. So until next week, make it easy and veg your best.